Guten Morgen, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, meine Damen und Herren, for an English welcome. Uh, my name is Stephen Ramage. I'm from the GEO Secretariat, and I'm just going to give you um, a few initial points to, to explain some of the logistics. As you can see from the agenda, we've got a packed schedule, but there will be coffee. And when you go out the door, you go to your left and you follow it around. That's where the coffee will be. That's also where the bathrooms, toilets, restrooms, whatever you call them, they're also around to the left. So left is important. Um, for sponsors, you can set up any time you want round at the coffee. So that you can start that from, from now. And I encourage everyone to go around and visit the sponsors when, when they're there. Um, just outside where you, uh, where you got your badges, that's where the posters will be. And again, the posters will get set up um, tomorrow, but we encourage you to go and visit the, the posters. So we'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, particularly UN OSA as our host and joint organizer, Development Seed, Eversys, European Space Imaging, Synergize, and TerraPulse. At the event, we'll have a number of the staff from the GEO Secretariat wandering around. So if I say your name, can you please show yourself? Craig? Doug? Gilberto? Gilberto too? Maddie, who's maybe outside at the desk, Paula, and Rick, who's also outside at the desk. So you can speak to any of us about the GEO work program, the knowledge management, engagement priorities, communications, or any other stuff that you want to, to learn about. Um, the hashtag for those tweeting is GEO, uppercase, data tech, lowercase. And like Previous other events, we will have Slido, but this time we won't have it showing on the screen. So those will be for you to put questions in for the consideration of the moderator. And again, you just put GEO, GEO, uppercase, into Slido, and you can pick each session where you want to put in questions. So now I'd like to hand over to Shiri Shrava, who's a senior program officer at UNUSA, and who's going to moderate this first session. Thank you, Stephen, for introductory words and welcoming words. And I welcome uh, all distinguished professionals sitting here, and also uh, Gilberto Camara, direct, executive director of GEO, uh, for this very important workshop on GEO data technology. Uh, so welcome to Vienna. And as you see, today is not the best day. But if you wait for a day, tomorrow will be a great day in Vienna with much brighter sunshine and much more life. And next week is going to be great here. So welcome all of you to Vienna. Uh, so as everyone knows that data has been becoming so important as three new frameworks have come into existence, SDGs, Sendai Framework, and Climate Change Agreement. Today morning, I got information from Philippines that there is an earthquake and they need satellite images, a lot of satellite images. And after this, right, uh, my work here, I have to get busy on that particular part. So that is the importance of data from the views of data providers, those who will analyze, those who will have the data ready as a background information needed for you know, assessment of damages. So data is needed everywhere. Uh, so I would like to welcome all, and I would like to uh, give my short presentation for setting the scene rather than saying just few words here. So I would like to request uh, displaying my presentation here. So I'll be briefly talking about UNOSA's role in promoting Earth observation data for SDGs and other international frameworks. Although we are not data providers, but we have big network of the data providers and we are very well connected to the end users and mainly in the developing country who need the data most because they lack the resources. They, lack, they don't have satellites, they don't have the uh, great uh, data systems there. And this is where our role comes into picture to close gaps between the developing countries and those who are very well equipped with data, uh, providing the data. This is not working. Here we go. 
thank you. Okay, I, I'm sure most of you uh, know about UNOSA, but just a word of introduction if someone don't know much. We, our vision is to bring benefits of space to humankind, and we promote international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space to achieve sustainable development goals. And the main features of our office, of course, everyone knows that we are Secretariat for Committee on Peaceful Uses for Outer Space, popularly called as COPUS. Our new initiatives are Space for Women, Space for Water, and my colleague is going to talk about Space for Water in the next session. UN Spider is the program. I just talked about Philippines requesting us satellite images for earthquake. That's the UN Spider program, which is the platform for uh, space-based information for disaster management and emergency response. We are also Secretariat for International Committee on Global Navigation Satellite System. Uh, and our new initiative called Access to Space Initiative, which is basically combining lots of our existing programs like Human Space Technology Initiative, and we are trying to provide access to scientists and countries, uh, like organizations from different countries to access the space, launch the satellites, or even conduct the experiments on the international space stations. So this is just short word. Coming to the theme of this particular workshop, the most important thing is the magnitude of data needed for achieving sustainable development goals. And we all know that sustainable development goals covers just about every dimension of development. It's a universal, it integrates, so all SDGs are integrated. We can achieve, cannot achieve one SDG without achieving the other one. And it's about transformation. It's really aiming at transforming the world. And it go across all the sectors like biosphere, society, and economy. And this is where data is needed for achieving SDGs. And about 232 statistical indicators to be produced by every country to benchmark the progress. Then next question comes that we need data that we trust. Only the trustworthy data will transform uh, the world. So there is a data revolution, but what we need is reliable and timely and granular data that shows the progress in achieving targets. Whether we are lying behind, lagging behind, we are progressing. And that's what we need to know, and that's why we need a good indicators, and without knowing good indicators, we can't assess the progress. Some experiences from our technical advisory missions that we conduct under the framework of work of UN SPIDER. Uh, and my ex-colleague Laurent is also sitting here who has contributed a lot to UN SPIDER for the last like 10 years. So through UN SPIDER, we have conducted almost more than 35 technical advisory missions to developing countries. And although we go with the reason to help the disaster management agencies, we actually meet all the organizations in the country that are involved in providing geodata or geospatial information. So in a way, this mission is much more comprehensive than just for disaster management. And we evaluate almost everything there, right from policies, coordination, uh, and then data uh, policies and what they have and what the challenges they are facing. And one thing came out very strikingly that many developing countries are still struggling to compile basic economic and social statistics and their capacity to produce these new indicators that is expected in achieving SDGs is quite limited. And another important challenge is that one third of the required SDG indicators, are, the data is from outside traditional official statistics. So there are conventional ways of getting statistics in countries, but much more indicators that demand data from the non-traditional sources. And this is where Earth observation comes into picture, use of non-traditional source data. And here, I also would like to point to the uh, UN Resolution 71 that talks about role of Earth observation and geospatial data in achieving ESDGs. And there is a Europe case, I think it's one of the most systematic way uh, ESA has compiled importance of Earth observation in achieving SDGs and 65 of 169 indicators directly benefit from European GNSS and Copernicus applications, either for monitoring or directly contributing to fulfillment of these SDGs. So when I go to developing countries, I'm giving this example to uh, various countries so that they can also start tagging each of the earth observation they are doing in their countries 
tagging that particular two SDGs, and that's very well done by uh, European Space Agency. And we have come out with a joint publication with ISA. It's called Supporting the Sustainable Development Goals, Building Block Towards the 2030 Agenda. So this publication is available online. Uh, here, uh, we found that more than 40% of the targets have direct relation to the Copernicus and EGNSS uh, applications. And the publication also supports 38 cases and best practices how uh, basically GNSS and Earth Observation Technology is directly used in achieving specific SDGs. So, underlying message is that we need a lot of data for achieving SDGs and 50 years of accumulated knowledge of Earth system is available to us. A lot of historical data and even recent data is now getting into open source data. Uh, and there is a knowledge on atmosphere, land and oceans and ice coverage and that can be used for creating the benchmarks for monitoring targets of SDGs. I would like to just introduce our role here. We also have knowledge portal. Uh, the website is un-spider.org. Here we compile all the data that is needed for disaster management cycle. And this, is, this also has lots of other things like lessons learned, step-by-step -step workflows, or massive online open courses, webinars. This is a one uh, stop basically uh, station for disaster management. People are those who are implementing Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Uh, we also link our portal to uh, GEOS portal and uh, our all data providers on group of authorization systems. This portal is linked in May 2018. The data sources from UN Spider knowledge portals are made available through GEOS portal. Uh, in general, this portal basically curates all the data that is that has relevance for disaster management, but with focus on Earth observation or space technologies. And there is one more portal, and there will be detailed presentation by my colleague Nina in the next session. That is Space for Water portal. It's a quite new development, last one year, and there will be detailed presentation on that. So through these portals, we are also contributing our bit in the uh, data revolution that is needed for achieving SDGs or climate change agreement or Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. So this is in brief, I would like to uh, tell uh, about, I mean, set the scene for this particular workshop. My last slide, it talks about airports at national level. And this is something about Sri Lanka and we are sorry to hear what happened last on the Easter in Sri Lanka. Probably our project will be postponed by a few months because of political you know, situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, but this is what we intend to do. We would like to set up the, all the databases for emergency response in the country and our Earth observation data needed for supporting Sendai framework that is establishing the baseline data for monitoring Sendai. Many countries do not have baseline data, then they cannot monitor what is the achievement. And we talk a lot about at regional and international level, but going to the country level and doing this, actually delivering, delivering the data repository, that becomes important. So we have taken Sri Lanka as one country and South Asia, that is SARC countries, as one of the region to develop this particular data repository that will be used not only for Sendai framework, but it will also have re relevance for uh, sustainable development goals, and that can also result into MOOC, massive online uh, open courses, uh, and also probably a Sri Lanka special data cube. So this is what our plan is, and there are a lot of partners contributing to this, our office. There is a disaster management center in Sark region based in India. There is international water management. There is the Delta State University, who is also, uh, which is also collaborating with us. And this project will kick off within a month. And this will be, I think, a good example where we can deliver really some tangible product to the country and then create some courses or, you know, kind of publication that can be used by other countries. So this is one attempt of going down to the country level. So, yeah, this is all I wanted to say and welcome again. Uh, and with this, I would like to hand over to Gilbert Kamara. Thank you. Good morning.
everyone, and thank you for all for coming to Vienna. Uh, my word uh, of thanks to all of the OU that have come long ways to be here to present and to discuss with us. My today, I'd like to ask you to recognize uh, the great work that goes always behind the scenes, but it's absolutely necessary, uh, which is done by the team of UNOSA, our guest, and also by the Geo Secretariat team. So my thanks to UNOSA for hosting us, and my thanks to the Geo Secretariat team, especially Paolo Di Salvo, who is always on the background solving problems, Doug and Rick and Maddie, who are doing great work in promoting the workshop. I think it would be, uh, we are at a very crucial stage uh, of our development in GEO, where new technologies are sweeping around the globe and changing the way we do business. And that's why we try to convene a data technology workshop so that we would have a very diverse uh, and very interdisciplinary group of uh, speakers. We're going to have people who have uh, interactions with the price agreement, disaster reduction, uh, the SDGs. We're going to hear from some of people from the work program activities of GEO. We're going to hear from all the cloud providers. We're going to hear from CEOs. Uh, there's a special session organized by CEOs. We're going to hear from the development of the GEOS platform guys. So this is going to be a very diverse and very uh, I would say informative workshop, and I would e really uh, encourage you to discuss and to interact with those either online or offline, uh, and to really to extract the benefits of this to the future of GEO. So my words are to thank to all of us for making this workshop possible. Thank you very much. I would like to welcome to the stage Brian Kilo, who is going to be also speaking in the session two. So perhaps that he could already stay here. His name is already here. So we can uh, make him physical presence, not just a virtual presence. Okay, so we start with the uh, session that's uh, officially called setting the scene, uh, although we already set the scene very well. Uh, so this is settings in part one, and that will be followed by coffee break and then part two starts. So I, I request Gilbert to camera to start his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I am very honored to talk to you and also very pleased to be as serving as Geo Secretary Director in a very interesting moment, like the Chinese say, may you live in interesting times, or you be careful of what you deserve because you may get it. So the, prop, the challenge we're facing is that we are at a very interesting time in Earth's observation as a whole, where technologies are changing the way we have done business before. And it's very important that our world, we tend to think of technology as an afterthought, but unfortunately, or fortunately, technology shapes the way we think. Just think of this, of how it has shaped elections, cultures, good speech, hate speech, good news, fake news. Technology has taken us by stride. And what are the consequences and implications for GEO? So can I add the slides? Yeah. For those of you who are not so familiar with GEO, just two words of presentation. We have a mission, the mission that was established by when the organization was started the discussions in 2002 and when it was formally established in 2005, which is to build the global Earth observation system of systems as a basis for providing global information for sound decision making. Now, I like to think, and perhaps this is, of course, I would admit a personal view, not shared ob obviously by everybody, 
that geo is an information technology enabled. I look at geo as a provider of knowledge based on advances on technology. And in that sense, we have to be cognizant of our users who use the data, the community who produces the results, the data that we have, and the means of production of that data. So how do we operate, for those of you who are not so familiar? We have, obviously, to recognize the data sources. So we have done a lot of work to organize and make visible data which is at different levels. That's what the group that develops the GEOS platform has been doing. You'll hear from them later today. We're going, we have a community. This community is organized around our work program, our activities and flagships. And this uh, will, you hear from them in a session later today where some of the speakers of the work program are gonna tell you what we're going to do. And this community provides the analysis of different things, biodiversity, forest, um, health, uh, wetlands. Uh, forest fires, uh, agriculture, you have everything there, biodiversity. So in that sense, we try to organize community to produce knowledge which is relevant for everyone. But we have a goal. The goal is to make sure that we are relevant for the three main agreements that our countries have signed, which are the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and UN Agenda 2030 that we all know talk about the SDGs. So this is a sample of what we call the GEO Work Program. You see GEO GLAM, Agricultural Monitoring, SDGs, uh, carbon and greenhouse gases, wetlands, cold regions, biodiversity, uh, mercury, and this is human planet, blue planet. You're going to hear from many of those today. And of course, Everyone here is doing a great work, but we have challenges. So what are the challenges that we have? So let's take one particular um, activity or flagship, as we call in GEO, one of the main uh, communities of GEO is the agricultural community. The agricultural community has done a fantastic job of engaging multiple stakeholders globally. So both at the global level, organizations like the World Food Program and FAO, uh, and at the country level, for example, USDA, Haradi, uh, uh, CRAD, CONAB in Brazil, SANSA in South Africa. So it's really um, putting all stakeholders together. And in the sense of stakeholder word, you have a stake in what comes. And this has enabled the work which is also a great funded by NASA, to improve substantially the early warning for crops, especially in developing countries, but also in developed countries. So there are bulletins, monthly bulletins for the crop monitor, where you have uh, lots of information which was not previously available, including the risk of crop failure. So there is uh, the Uganda Prime Ministry Office has stated, as you can read there, in the past we always reacted to crop failure, spending billions of shillings to provide food aid. In 2017 was the first time we acted proactively because we had clear evidence from satellite data very early in the season. So this is really affecting directly people's livelihoods. But despite the great work that GeoGlam is doing, the community has challenges, and they're discussing, this is a slide I stole from the GeoGlam guys. They have ambitions, and the group of GeoGlam uh, researchers funded by ESA, which is located, led by the University, Université Catholique de Louvain, uh, by Professor Pierre de Fourny, has developed a number of methods that can, for example, provide the cultivated land map at 10 meter using Sentinel data, monthly cloud fee surface reflectance, vegetation status, crop type map. Okay, they have done it in their lab in Louvain. Works fine. How do you make 
all countries which are interested in agriculture, and mostly, I mean, very few countries would not be, use this technology. This is a challenge, and we're discussing with them. How do you go, once you have a thing that works in the lab very nice, how do you go global? The same goes for uh, Geobon, our biodiversity community. Leticia is here, and she, I stole her slide from her. Navarro is Leticia, which is sitting down. Thank you, Leticia. Uh, here is, they have developed a vision about what they call the biodiversity essential variables and to develop the biodiversity change indicators. They have discussed how to obtain data from citizen science, survey users, combine them with observations from uh, uh, land use, from remote sensing, temperature, climate, and to try to set up some uh, possibilities of species distribution. But again, it's impossible for a single place of GeoBon to provide whole analysis globally for all kinds of uh, biodiversity issues. Because some people are interested on certain types of plants, some people are interested on bees, some people are interested on other types of flora and fauna. It's, I mean, one thing is to have a lot of research who covers many aspects which show promise. The other thing is, how is that used? So this brings us to the challenge that we have. Provide food, water, and energy for 9.4 billion people, avoid dangerous climate change, and protect the planet's biodiversity. And for those of you who have not had the chance yet, please give yourself a favor and l listen to, it's in YouTube, it's open, the latest BBC movie, Climate Change, The Facts, narrated by Sir David Attenborough, and has a very nice piece with uh, featuring one of our members of community, Matt Hansen from Maryland, talking about how uh, Earth's observation can support climate change. Very nice, fantastic. You know, when the Brits do it, they want to do it, they do it nice. Fantastic work by BBC. So, the deal is that those who are looking at the, at the challenge of sustainable development, uh, many who come from the technical side, who are engineers, who come from space agencies or come from university, sometimes lose the dimension of the political decisions which are necessary. What's a political decision? Sustainable development is a trade-off between the present and the future. So if I'm a politician in office, any country in the world, I have to decide how much do I impose on restrictions on fossil fuels and land change now, and what do I lose in terms of economics, and what do I gain from the future? It's a trade-off. It's always a trade-off. If you suddenly stop all consumption of fossil fuels in the world, the future generations will thank you very much, and the current generations will vote you out of office. So it's the decision makers who are the crucial ones that need to be reached by our work. So there is a trade-off between knowledge and action. And the trade-off is knowledge, what we produce here of the people in this room, informs us about the limits of the planet. But action is where societies decide. So one of the crucial bits that we need to work together with our work program and our community is how to link knowledge to action. Because if we just produce knowledge, and this knowledge has no impact on the action, then we lose our main goal, which is work towards sustainable development, because those in the position for decision will not take it. So the key here is trust. Trust is the only way out. In which sense I'm talking about trust? In the sense that decision makers have good reasons to trust people that give us the information. And they have good reasons not to trust other people. There are enormous precedents in history. So that's why many communities who produce knowledge for sustainable development have been talking strongly about what we call co-design and co-production. What is co-design and co-production? 
the stakeholders themselves are involved in setting up the results. In other words, it's you can do world-class science in your laboratory in somewhere on Earth, but don't expect just because your results are fantastic that everybody is going to use them. These are two different things. You may be able to, uh, to uh, print or have your paper printed in science, but still, it does not mean that the persons affected will take the decision. So trust is the key for producing what we call socially robust results. So we make a difference between reliable knowledge, knowledge that communicates its discoveries to society, which is papers in science, nature, PNAS, whatever, and socially robust knowledge. Knowledge which is transdisciplinary, co-designed with the stakeholders, open and replicable. So, when it works, it works. And the beauty of Earth's observations is Earth's observations are much better than the SDGs. In, they go beyond SDGs. So if you use Earth's observation for the SDG, you can do the SDGs and do something better, which you answer questions that the, S, the SDGs do not require you to answer. For example, where? How much? How much is the SDG question? Percentage of forest land as percentage of forest area, uh, increase in water availability. SDGs is essentially about how much. But SDGs are not about where. They're not about when. They're not about who. And a lot of the beauty of Earth's observation for SDGs is that you not only are able to answer the how much question, but also the where question and the when question. So it, it is crucial that uh, the use of Earth's observation on SDG is not a luxury, as many people think. It is essential to policy. Let me give you a real example, which is very deep to my heart. And the year is 1988, and we are preparing for the famous and most important Rio 92 conference. So do you trust the World Bank? World Bank, serious institution. The World Bank comes with a report this report exists, I've just copied it, I can follow. Say, the report is called Government Policies and Deforestation in Brazil's Amazon Region. And it says, Landsat images indicate, so using, referring to Earth's observation, that deforestation has accelerated sharply since the mid 70s, as shown in table one, the, the, the forest area increased to 100 to 25 square kilometers in 80 and to almost 600,000 square kilometers by 8088. The 88 figure is larger than France. So if you take 600,000, take 125 and divide by eight, you get 60,000. So the World Bank is saying Brazil has been deforesting 60,000 square kilometers of forest per year. Do you trust the World Bank? This is the typical thing that a report produced by people who supposedly have the authoritative. Completely wrong. Completely and utterly and totally, I mean, uh, I would like to say not even wrong. Therefore, at that time, our team at the National Institute of Space Research established a very comprehensive, wall-to-wall, -wall, carefully done monitoring of the Amazon forest. Who tells us how much, who tells where, who tells when, and who tells who? In this authoritative data, we got, we got Red Plus funds for 1.3 billion out of that. Brazil's INDC used that data, and there are more than 1,000 papers. So this is a data who is trusted. Took 30 years of work. So what's the story here? The story is that GEO needs to create not only the results which are important, but to make these results reusable. So access to methods, codes, models, source data, enable others to reuse the results in their country based on local circumstances, create a broad network of EO practitioners, which are in control of the tools they use. And this is becoming much more possible now than it was 20 years ago. I've shown this graph over and over and never ceased to amaze me. I was in China last week. You know, every year there are six or eight million 
graduates from Chinese universities. They have 60 million people in universities in China. It's crazy. So the world is big. Everywhere you look, there are more people being educated. So it's not only North America and Europe who are the leaders, but there's more Chinese, double the number of Chinese in university than there are in the United States. If you add India, if you add Indonesia, if you add Brazil, there is a huge amount of people who are much better trained than they were. And these people are born into what is called the new digital economy. They don't know a world without Wikipedia, without the web. I'm sorry to say, without Facebook. Uh, they are there. So they take this model for granted, the model of big data with a public API and low access cost. And this model has already been a model which has shown its power for Earth observation. Google Earth Engine, many of you know, there are more than 2,000 papers using Google Earth Engine. So I've been pleading you, please, let's all adopt the zero download model. What's the zero download model? I was a president of a big space agency he was saying, oh, I have so many millions of downloads by image. And I told him, I will be proud if I were you the day there will be zero downloads. That's much better. No download. All the data in the cloud. You upload your software. Users will much be happy, and it's much cheaper. And there's no cloud. There's clouds. There is Climate Data Store. My friend Baudouin is sitting there. There are the, the, the Copernicus Cloud on the Mundi. There's Esri Cloud. There's Amazon. There's Microsoft. There's Google Earth Engine. There's Ali Cloud. I've learned in China that now China is moving a lot of data to their cloud. So clouds are becoming the place to go for data, especially big image data and raster data. Clouds allow earth science community to share their findings, to document their developments, and make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, what we call FAIR. But working in the cloud is a different way of doing. You don't download any data. You have a huge image database, which is now all the data is there. And the first thing you do is filter. Let me pick up a little bit of the data I have. And then I have a process that produces an interactive map, and I use my own data as in-situ uh, in data to validate what is going on. And there are more and more there are tools for observational data analysis are being shared, like Jupyter Notebooks. More and more people are discovering that Earth observation data has no secrets because all knowledge is available in books and papers. So there's very little there that's off limits to young and capable researchers. So the way we like to think about GEO is that we need to continue providing open data, but we need to jump also to the bandwagon of open science because open science is the only way to produce results which are trusted. Without open science, there is very little trust. And therefore, the crucial bit that I would like to ask you to consider is to uh, work, make your work reproducible. Whatever, there are different ways to do it, but most make your work reproducible. What does it mean to make your work reproducible? Publish your paper, publish your code, publish your data, link your data to your code, link your data to your paper. Allow people to reuse your data. This is the way we reach a global audience. Share your in-situ data. Share your software. For example, fantastic work here by my friend sitting on my side, Brian Kilo, Open Data Cube, open source, fully on GitHub. If you want to contribute, very easy to do. So this is the trends 
and what the geo secretariat together with our many of our you are working we are discussing internally and externally whether we can provide support for you to move into open science that's where we are discussing the idea of a geo knowledge hub the idea is to organize the reproducible knowledge produced by the geo community and we're discussing we're going to have sessions here uh, we're going to have a, some demos of some ideas that we're having, and we hope that you can help us with that. And how can you, you do? First thing, you have to organize your, your knowledge, codify your knowledge. You have to say, well, I've published a journal paper. Let me publish the data. Let me publish the software. Let me make sure I, I, I'm clearly stating which data I'm using in the cloud. Let me share the results. It takes more work, but the world needs it. It's your duty to the, to, do, to the sustainable development part. It's nice to talk about, you know, the duty of politician A, B, and C, and D, but every one of us has a duty. And we have the means to make knowledge reproducible. So our idea that we're discussing and proposing and having many discussions with the community is to set up a collection of curated documents to link code with data and papers. That's what the Knowledge Hub is, the, the idea of a Knowledge Hub. I'm not going to go into much detail. There will be a demo later on. It's also important that the Knowledge Hub is in complete uh, synchrony with the data providers, and the data providers uh, have done a great work in uh, providing data to the GEOS platform. You see a demonstration here, which has millions of assets. And what we're trying to do is that the assets, which are the data, would be linked through the Knowledge Hub to the papers, to the software that does things, to the descriptions, to the in situ data, which sometimes is not shared. So we want to, this is an add on to the current work of the GEOS platform, uh, into which we try to make, the, make good the potential of the data. The data by itself is very good but data plus methods plus code plus sharing plus reuse is even better. So what we want to get is a community of empowered experts, people who produce, use the cloud to produce what we call reusable shared knowledge and who share fully their data, their in situ observations. And that's where we want to get to. And we'll not get there without your participation, your collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilberto. Uh, some of the messages you passed, they were so relevant. Last December, I was in Nepal, and we just took account of what happened in 2015 earthquake. There was a lot of satellite images and data was poured in Nepal. And this organization called EC Mode, which, is, uh, which has a state of art scientific infrastructure, they were overwhelmed with satellite images and data, and they were downloading it. And after downloading terabytes of image, several images were with cloud or they were not useful. So this is what uh, you said that data zero download, but uh, that will increase the basis. I, I, I cannot, I, I, I cannot, I can allow me to be Gilberto for two minutes. And just to tell you that, <laughs> Uh, we are extremely happy that ECMOD has made a proposal, one of our proposals to our Geo Amazon Cloud Credits program. So if the proposal is approved, ECMOD will have uh, a number of about $100,000 of credits using Amazon platform to do their work. No need for downloading any longer. So please tell your friends in ECMOD that we are welcome their, present, their proposal and we hope it goes through the process of approval. That's, that's a good news because when we had a meeting with the humanitarian community who were saving lives and data provider like ECMOD, there was a big conflict between them last year. They said nothing was useful and ECMOD was saying, we were doing our best to provide you everything. So I hope these kind of solutions will definitely close the gap. So this was a very good message from your presentation. Thank you. And now we are very well within time. I invite uh, Brian uh, Kilog. From NASA. Thank you, presentation. Good morning, thank you. I'll talk a little bit about the Open Data Cube, and I 
uh, agree with the zero download idea, and we'll see that in several places in this presentation. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a data cube is, I expect that probably 90% of you here are familiar with it now. Uh, we've been pursuing this for quite some time and making some great progress, but um, still there's many people that are not quite sure what this idea is and this concept. So if you take satellite data and we like to see it prepared into what we call analysis ready data so that no other preparation is needed, we take that data and we extract out the spatial and time information and we put it into stacks. So imagine that these stacks three-dimensionally are in space and in time. And once they're compiled, and all that data is put in the cloud. Uh, we, we don't want it locally downloaded unless uh, it's, there's absolutely a need for that. Um, and then we apply applications and tools. And in our case, we have a, a number of applications within a library of, of uh, resources for algorithms. And we also have a user interface that can connect to that for those people that do not want to play with the code but just want to run some analytical results. And that's working quite well. So this idea of a data cube, we have been pushing analysis-ready data into, uh, into this cube to make it easier for the users. Uh, we have found, especially in developing countries, their ability to pre-process this data and to get it into a usable form, uh, it's, it's very difficult for them to do that. So we have to get this data pre-processed into this analysis-ready data format. Everything we're doing with Open Data Cube is free and open source software. So you can see the algorithms, you can see the core code. None of it is um, uh, none, none of it is it's not available to you. Um, inter interoperability. So and time series. When we stack this data, one of the key uh, features of all of this is the ability to look through time very efficiently and effectively. So I can run my analyses in a spatial single time period, I can run my analyses in time, and it's very easy to do that. But when it comes to interoperability, we're talking about using multiple kinds of data sets, different data sets together in the same environment. So imagine using optical data and radar data together. Uh, many parts of the world are full of clouds, very difficult to get data in certain times of the year, and so this gives us an advantage. This idea of the data cube can be put into a cloud or a local computer. Now, I will say that even though I completely uh, agree with this idea of going everything to the cloud and zero downloads, I have found in some visits to Africa that the internet is still extremely poor. There are still the need for some local implementations, and so we can put this data cube in a local computer in time when the world's internet picks up and uh, everyone has the same type of access, the cloud will definitely be the choice. Uh, we have a user interface and algorithms available. And so this is working in many countries. I, I often call our colleagues from Australia the godfather of the data cube. That's where it all started. And then a few of us within the CIOS organization said, can we take this concept of the data cube that's functioning in Australia and can we globalize this? Not sure where that feedback's coming. I'll just keep on going and maybe my loud voice will get through it. Um, it's also being used in Colombia, Switzerland, Vietnam. We have five countries in Africa and an African regional data cube. Uh, you'll hear later, uh, I think tomorrow or the next day from Trent about the Digital Earth Africa, which is really an exciting uh, next phase of what we're doing in the data cube and applying that to continental Africa. So there's 50 countries or more interested in the data cube, and it's really exciting to see. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the data and what our experiences have been with this data. We're promoting analysis-ready data, but the, the real problem is it doesn't exist everywhere in the cloud, and I, the key word is yet, and I think we're getting there. In the case of Landsat, Unfortunately, we're still downloading the surface reflectance data out of the cloud and then putting it back up into uh, either another cloud or locally, indexing it. All that it won't be necessary by the end of this year. By the end of this year, all of the surface reflectance pre-processed data for Amazon will be, or for USGS Landsat will be on the cloud. So you don't have to order it. It will be there and easily available. 
Sentinel-1 radar, <coughs> there is no global source of analysis-ready data. So if you think about the simplest analysis-ready data product from radar, it would be backscatter intensity. So just a few bands, VVVH, a backscatter, where can I get that information globally? You cannot get it globally. Nobody is pre-processing the level one. So we're working in a few areas. We've been I'm part of a, a, of a team with uh, Amazon where we're discussing the idea of somebody pre-processing this data to this level two format, and Amazon has agreed to host it. That's one example. I'm betting over time this will, this will um, solve itself. Same with Sentinel-2. Now, since December of 2018, uh, the Europeans have been pre-processing analysis-ready data, surface reflectance globally, but that's only four months, five months. Well, what about the data back to 2016? That is no longer, that, that's not a solution right now. So there's two years of good data that we would like to get pre-processed and also put into the cloud. So I've been talking with a number of people in Europe uh, through ESA and the Commission, also talking with some folks like uh, Synergize who have been doing this and working with, with the uh, Europeans. And I think there's also a few solutions out there that are gonna make this happen. So I am quite confident that probably within a year's time, we will have analysis ready data for Landsat, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and I, I've noted ALOS Pulsar, all of that will be readily available in the cloud for the globe, which is really exciting. And then this zero download option will be uh, in existence, will be fantastic. So the key becomes getting some of these things uh, solved and, and moving along. And, and I, I forgot to mention there, ALOS Pulsar, uh, thanks to Japan, they have created these annual mosaics Yes, we don't have the time slices in between, but it's a great start. And having an annual mosaic for, I think it's seven or eight epics, seven or eight years, is really exciting. So how do we, if we have that data, what can we do with it? And we, we use that data in the cube with a number of algorithms. Uh, this, these are just a few examples here that we have had great success with. So in the case of optical data, we can do cloud-free mosaicing. Uh, obviously spectral indices, various combinations of the bands, classifying land. One, one new one that we're working on is an eight class decision tree using an FAO uh, class system. Uh, that's coming along nicely, but one of our problems is we need ground validation data to test this and make it work. Well, it, it, it's easy to create an unsupervised land classification algorithm. The hard part is to actually supervise it and get some good validation data. So we're hoping to get that. Uh, we have a few algorithms for water that work quite nicely. We've actually adopted an algorithm from Australia called Water Observation from Space WAFs, and we've adopted that to work on Sentinel-1 data. And the key is that we train the data using machine learning algorithm, and we train the Landsat data with the Sentinel data, and we get a correlation of like 97, 98%. So Sentinel data can see water beautifully and not an issue with clouds. And then also land change. Land change is a huge one. Uh, we're looking at some spectral anomaly thresholds. There's some more complicated algorithms like PyCCD. So these last two charts here are uh, lessons learned and way forward. And this is the, the key message that I'd like to get across to you, or what are we struggling with and how, we're, how are we gonna do this going forward? I already mentioned that analysis ready data is important. It is truly no longer a desire, but it's an expectation. People do not want to pre-process this data. We need to do it for them, and we need to make it globally available in the cloud. <laughs> and so the production of this is still difficult. It's just not an easy thing. Uh, if it were really easy, I think every satellite data provider would just do it right off the bat and get to the analysis-ready data, and it would all be available. But it's not an easy process. There's also that step in between that some scientists would rather have the level one data and do their own pre-processing. So there's this, this balance you have to figure out. I would, I would say that most of the world would just love the analysis ready data in level two format and not have to mess with it. But the power scientists still say, let me do that pre-processing. Um, the third bullet is this idea of zero downloads. The, the avoiding egress is critical. The data sizes here are enormous. We're dealing with gigabyte sized individual scenes. 
as you were just saying, terabytes of data being downloaded, and then you find out half the scenes are full of clouds. It just doesn't make sense. And if we put this in the in the cloud and we can query that data, it's very easy then to sift through and find the information you want. The fourth bullet, the internet, we take for granted, we think it's perfect. For most of us in this room, there's not an issue. I have found for a lot of the world, it is still an issue. So we still need to have some solutions that run locally. Until the internet catches up, if, we, if a country wants data and their internet is poor, we still need to find a way to get them the data. And I, I think this is a, a difficult thing for us to tackle, but it's one that we cannot ignore. Uh, clouds, and I, I don't mean cloud computing, but I mean optical clouds or visible clouds if you walk outside, that's an issue. It's an issue for the Landsat and Sentinel data. So with that, we're seeing this growing interest in radar. The problem with the radar data, and if you think about it, radar data has really only been available since 2014 in a free and open environment. So there is a vast community of people out there, researchers, that have only been using radar data for four or five years. That's not a lot of time. So there's a need to understand its benefits and to train people how to use this data. Once they learn how to use radar data, I think they're going to find it's really an amazing set of data and this cloud issue goes away. Yes, it has a little bit less information if you really think about you know, the Sentinel-1 data, it's kind of two pieces of information, two bands, VVVH, as opposed to maybe seven or 10 optical bands in Landsat and Sentinel. So for some, they might argue, well, it has less information. But if you take the clouds out of there and the, the, the world is covered in clouds 50% of the time on average, that's a huge advantage. And then finally, the, the way forward and, and where we would like to go. This Open Data Cube community that we have is really growing rapidly. There's a lot of interest out there. Uh, we have a, a, a group of us that have come together. We, we have a partners forum. We have a steering group that does the technical work. We're always looking for more developers and users, and it's exciting and it's moving very rapidly. So we're gonna keep pushing that forward. Capacity development is crucial. If we want to bring people in, uh, ahead in the world to use satellite data, we have to teach them how to use it. Just last week, I was in Senegal, had a room of 50 people teaching them how to use the data cube and uh, the data that we've supplied for them. And most of their, their knowledge is, is quite, um, quite low uh, in terms of how do they take this data and apply it to the problem they have. They realize the data is available and they might have used it in other traditional methods, but now having it available in this time series stacked data cube, they're excited about how to use it, but they need to learn a bit more. The open data cube is unique, but it is not the only solution. Uh, there are many other options out there. Google Earth Engine is a perfect example. Uh, I'm often asked, well, how is this different to Google Earth Engine? Yes, it's different. It's just another solution and it has advantages over some, but it's, there, there's no perfect solution. So take advantage of the multiple solutions out there. We know that new technologies are always around the corner. We have to be agile, we have to be aware of what's coming, and if that means that the way we stack data and the way we interrogate data for the Open Data Cube, in five years from now, that might not be the best solution, and we're okay with that. We just need to migrate towards the better solutions, because technology is changing fast. We have a lot of application algorithms. We're working really hard on the SDGs. For instance, uh, we've just recently developed some preliminary algorithms for 661 water, 1131 urbanization, and 1531 land degradation. It's really exciting to see that we can take this time series information and apply it directly to the SDGs. Uh, you'll hear later from Andrea later in the week on what we're doing in CIOS for analysis ready data. We're putting together some core definitions of what we believe uh, the community accepts as a definition of analysis ready data. And we're also trying to tackle this problem of data flows. So earlier I talked about how can I get Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data pre-processed, available in the cloud for everybody in the world. That's my goal and we're gonna have to continue to work that. And I call that a data flow problem. And then finally, this interoperability. It's really exciting to think that if I can have Landsat Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 data all in the same framework in a time series uh, stack in a cloud, 
there's an incredible opportunity there. I have yet to see people use that set, set of data, let's say all three of those data sets to tackle a single problem. And the reason you don't see that is it's extremely complex to do, to pull that data together and to put it in a framework that makes sense. I believe the open data queue is gonna get us much closer to that. And uh, that's the end, thank you. So thank you, Brian, very interesting. Uh, and I think these two presentations have set up very good uh, uh, scene for rest of the workshop. Uh, some of your points were, uh, they are, I feel them so intensely when I visit the developing world, like poor internet. And this is really one thing that prohibits use of cloud or you want to say data cube. And yes, the practical solution is to host the data locally for time being and yes, and hope things will improve. So one example from Myanmar, uh, I, was just, I just want to talk the real examples rather than the concept. In 2012, when we went for advisory mission there, and we compile all the data, basically someone from uh, uh, US, basically USGS, yes. uh, she came with basically hard disk and all the open source data available, like Landsat and elevation models and everything, it was put in the one uh, disk and such five disks were brought to Myanmar and given to five different ministries. And we told them this is everything about Myanmar, what is available in the domain, public domain. And in 2012, we were not much talking about open data, downloadable data and all that. So to our surprise, not a single ministry shared those disks with any other ministries in the rest of the years. From there, now we see the change in 2018, Myanmar is working on the one map policy. So what you talked about interoperability, which is very important. So one map policy is basically talking of, uh, talking about the interoperability policy, improving internet. But one thing intensely appealed and that can be topic of a little bit of discussion here is, uh, yeah, last time I think this is stopped. Yeah. Yeah. One important hurdle, the concept is great, world is doing that. I'm, suppose I'm a government officer who owns the road data. I'm in charge of transport department. I have road data for my country. I'm happy to see all the data from navigation system and enjoy that data. But if someone in my country asks my road data to to be shared, I won't share it. That is the thing happening in all the countries. So people are happy with the open data, but when they are asked to share their national databases in the cloud for benefit of their countries to their counterpart ministries or uh, system ministries, that is not happening. And the reason for that is one is awareness that data that is you are holding is not a data really. Data that is shared is the real data that can be useful. And second part is that fear of data security. They say, if we put our data in cloud systems or something like that, the data is not secure. So what is needed in order to really make these concepts work in large part of developing countries is a lot of awareness at decision makers level so that they really appreciate potential of data cube and the related concepts of pre-processed data, uh, high internet speed or interoperability on all other, all other element. And that I think that particular thing will only drive this concept of data cube really into the decision making for the benefit. This is just one suggestion and probably we can do a lot in partnership this uh, we, uh, together in the partnership so that this change can happen at the governance level and then technical solutions will become more useful. So on this, any thoughts you would like to share? And also I will invite comments from the uh, audience because we still have a few minutes. Uh, the way, just for your information, the way we're trying to organize is that Stephen is receiving a number of questions on this app, Slido. Although we not, can always open for the audience for questions, maybe I would ask Stephen to then handle the questions and then open to also the audience for speaking. So the, the first question is, the zero download model sounds great. Does this therefore mean that you see a future world where all of our data is in all of the cloud environments? Well, 
of the maps of the world are available to you in your device. Who has navigated into Beijing with map on paper? Who, how long ago you navigated in London with the London AZ guide? Look at what's coming. It's a simple. Technology leaves no trace behind. It is perverse in that sense. Because once it changes, it changes forever. So, I mean, this is it. It's coming. And it's written on the wall. It doesn't even need written on the wall. It's written on the PowerPoint. But, you see, I have no doubt about it. Because once a technological solution brings itself, it feeds on itself, and it destroys what is back. It's as simple as that. So I'll, 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 I'll merge the next two questions. Um, the question was, would a data provider be willing to share their data in a public-private cloud, which is, to your point, Shirish, and then the second one is, what role should cloud providers play in getting data into their cloud? Maybe, Brian, you want to take that? Yeah, it's, um, the, the cloud providers have really been an excellent partner in everything that we've been doing. Um, and in, in terms of their role, I, you know, you have to, I guess, look at their business model and how they're dealing with it. In many cases, I'm just going to use Amazon for an example because I, I work with them and that's where a lot of our data sits. They're hosting huge global data sets for us for, for free. And then, you know, um, in order to use their powerful computing to run algorithms or perhaps store your own products, then that's uh, where there's a paid service model uh, embedded in that. But Google, through Google Earth Engine, is hosting all of that data for free. Amazon is doing it, and you have other clouds around the world. So I, I think it's just a matter of time that all of this satellite data will be free and open and available on these cloud systems. But, you know, it comes back to that old saying, nothing is completely free. And, yes, you're going to be able to get free access to it, but there are some costs associated with you uh, using their powerful computers to generate your products and then to store those products. So one, one of the things that's been mentioned a lot is interoperability, and interoperability requires standards, Mary Francois. Um, that someone has mentioned here um, cloud-optimized geotiffs, and I would probably add the spatial temporal asset catalog stack so do you have a view on Stack and COG, either of you? I know you've both done some things, some thinking about it. I don't know as much about Stack. There's probably a few others in the room that might. But, you know, in terms of COGS, we have found that um, computationally they're a lot easier to query the data and to use the data. So if you put it into a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF format, uh, just, you know, those words alone, cloud-optimized, means that the way that the data is formulated and packed, it is very well optimized for querying in a cloud environment. And so you just can't put it up there in the standard GeoTIFF uh, blocks. It's better in these uh, COG formats. And, you know, there's been a number of papers out there and, and a, quite a bit of uh, research that's been done, but computationally it's really excellent. I just want to, to stress two points. The first is there is a need to recognize the important work that the OGC has given us. And there will be a presentation on the workshop on the Sensor Web Enablement OGC standard, which is quite useful and quite important and should be uh, relevant for us all. Uh, the other thing is sometimes there are solutions that come which show to be easier than the design solutions that come, uh, let's say, from committees. So let me just, uh, not to be too technical, but if you compare uh, the origin of the WC consortium, 
made a huge amount of effort in developing the RDF format, which had, in theory, many advantages. And as time goes on, many of the big players have changed it to things like JSON and JSON-LD, which are not so powerful, but much simpler to do. So sometimes we have some conflicts. One of the toughest ones we're going to face is unless currently, unless you use an application such as Open Data Cube, which runs with different clouds, you, there is no easy way to interoperate your application between Google Earth Engine and Open Data Cube and other technologies. It's hard. It's hard because it's hard. It's not hard because OGC hasn't done their work or people are not doing the work. It's hard because it's damn hard. There are very reasons for that, but the question, the most in question here is the issue of time. When you put, when, when only space you have into the picture, interoperability becomes much easier. When you mix space and time, there's so many alternatives to, to, to query data that it becomes a choice, and the choice you do affects uh, the interoperability that you get, in this case, you don't get. So I don't expect any miracle to come soon. I know OGC is doing a strong work, but the problem is hard and will continue to be so. So, Shirish, I'll just do one more question, then I'll hand back to you. I know there are some questions from the floor as well. So, um, someone who's actually identified themselves, uh, Joan Masso, our friend from CREAF, um, he is an ODC convert. Um, and there's a bit of a confession here. Um, he's, he's now working on the Catalan Data Cube, but he wants to know, is there a plan to federate the Open Data Cube instances in a big one? I, I, and I'm just uh, guessing about where they're going with this, and that is to uh, create a connection with eventually like a, a global data cube. Yeah. So I, I'll give you my personal vision on where I think this is going. And the example starts with Digital Earth Africa. We took uh, data cube, started in Australia, one country, worked well. We said, let's globalize this idea. We then started adopting it in a few other countries one by one. Seems to be working well. People are liking it, using it, and it makes sense. We did it in five countries in Africa as a prototype African Regional Data Cube. That now has led to a $20 million program called Digital Earth Africa you'll hear about later, which is really exciting. So my vision would be a set of regional data cubes that are interconnected. It's really tough to have a single global data cube. Uh, I just think that regionally makes a bit more sense because of the people that are using it in, in given regions. Um, and computationally, it might make sense also to have it uh, segregated in regions. So I think over time, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw, you know, a South American regional cube and an, a Southeast Asia and a European and all that could come together. And maybe in the end, we'll have seven or eight regional data cubes, which in time would compile and become, you know, a global data cube. So now the floor is also open for 10 more minutes for questions. So I guess, uh, yeah, yourself, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think Brian just was tipped because I was just going to ask him about why the national scale approach and not regional scale. And you went there, Brian, but I'm wondering why are we not immediately now having had the experience in uh, with Digital Earth Africa, why aren't we pitching it to the countries from that angle immediately so that there we can actually, they can have the cost sharing and, you know, Econ 101, rather than developing these national level prototypes where each country has to find money in their budgets to put towards it, why not just approach the regions from that regional data cube perspective? I think it really comes down to um, money and support to make this happen. So in the case of Africa, we had to show that the five countries in the African Regional Data Cube were having success and that they um, could show some benefits of this. And then they were able to take that through their governments 
up to um, broader entities, and in, in this case, we approached you know, philanthropic organizations, and that's what ended up funding it to get it going. Many of these countries uh, can't take this on by themselves. They just don't have the money and resources to do it. So it really becomes, let's take, for example, if we want to have a data cube, uh, we've been thinking about one in Latin America. If we want to have a Latin American data cube, and there's you know, 10, 20 countries in that region, how is that going to be funded? Who is going to get behind that and support that and make it happen? And so the way I, I think that has been working is we show that it works in one or two countries in the region. Those two or three countries become the spokesperson for you know, the success, and then they are able to help convince these larger donors to make it happen. So I think, you know, in the perfect world, yeah, it'd be great just to say, hey, get a regional data cube here, 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 let's just make it all happen instantaneously. But it takes some support and it takes some backing from uh, what we call the stakeholders, right? These key stakeholders that really find this uh, of value. Hope I answered that, Jana. Let me just complete, Jana, because I think you raised an important point. Uh, uh, as a secretary director, we're very much aware of the fact that the idea of open data cubes in, in plural, which catching up, it would be important that the secretariat is, uh, if not only promotes the idea, which it's what we're doing, but also supports countries who want to do it. So we have we have requested some of the those who have the received some grants like Digital Earth Africa to support at least one person in the Secretariat to support the countries. Because if we are going to pitch the idea to many countries, we need to people who are dedicated. I have discussed this with Brian. I mean, his time, he's only one person. He doesn't, he could be three, but he looks like three, but he's only one. And of course, uh, we need, uh, if we want to pitch the idea to many countries, it would be good to have more people supporting it, especially uh, from uh, the global perspective, like GEO. Secretariat would be an interesting place to connect all of those that are interested in the, in the ideas such as the Open Data Cube. Um, good morning. Um, just just one question on uh, similar lines, uh, I would say, how how we are foreseeing this uh, in the long run uh, in terms of uh, funding? Uh, the, the the issue it's absolutely crucial, I think, and uh, the data availability and the opportunity for a broader community to use the data that's absolutely fantastic, and it's been proven in the past how that is being uh, useful. Uh, um, the question goes a little bit on, on the long run, the, the, the commercial uh, need for support of the structure that maintain those, uh, all those, uh, the infrastructure to, for the data um, uh, storage and use, um, and on, in parallel with the society and government uh, needs, I'd say. Would, would like a, uh, some sort of a broader fund that would support activities like that be something interesting to look at? Um, uh, it's just, uh, well, it's a short question, but kind of a thought about that. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll make a few comments. So one is uh, in the case of, um, you know, Digital Earth, uh, Digital Earth Africa, I think, um, You know, the, the, funding, the funding for that is coming from philanthropic organizations, right? It's, and it's going to be put out in, in a variety of, of work, and most of it's going to be for capacity building and maintaining that core infrastructure. But there'll be commercial opportunities involved in that, right? Uh, that $20 million of funds is, is not necessarily going entirely, you know, into uh, government organizations or other other organizations uh, inside, it'll it'll go to Amazon in case of uh, hosting some of the data, and there'll be other commercial opportunities. So, for many of these initiatives, I think there there is some great great opportunity. Um, I just want to add because we did some calculations of the what the Americans call the TOC, the total cost. Those TCO, total cost of ownership, yeah. 
Uh, I mean, it's a factor of three uh, in favor of a cloud provider like Amazon. It's a factor of three, factor of three, four. Because uh, the problem is the depreciation. I mean, you say, oh, I want to have my own cloud. I want to buy my own hardware. Of course, you have to buy your own hardware. You have to pay for your own hardware. The disks break. You have to pay for the guy who operates that. You have to pay for the energy. You have to pay for everything. You have to maintain it running 24 by 7. This is, this is, uh, this is not for, for the fainted-hearted. Even big institutions have trouble with that. And it's essentially cost, a question of cost-effectiveness. It's much more cost-effective. And I think as long as there is uh, the crucial bit for GEO here is to avoid what we call vendor lock-in. This is what we are being committed. What do you mean vendor lock-in? Is to promote solutions that work on different cloud vendors. And with that, we can ensure that the playing field is not completely let's say, distorted towards a single vendor. As long as the community promotes solutions that avoid vendor lock-in, uh, we, we are more resilient to the changes in policies in the commercial sector. So there's a, just, just to wrap up, there's a couple more from Slido. Um, one is, how can, can you comment on the European Commission decision to launch four or five different DAS if there should be one single cloud direction taken? I cannot. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I shouldn't either. <laughs> um, so, uh, and maybe it's just um, my understanding of, of DAS, but, you know, the DAS is there's four of them and they all have different capabilities and much of what they're doing is um, providing a data service and producing products um, out of the, their cloud. Uh, they're not meant to be an open source of data um, for people to use, um, you know, to install things of their own unless you go with them and work with them directly. So they're a little bit different, I guess, than you know, than a Google or Amazon or one of the uh, the China cloud that are probably a bit more open to broader population um, to use. Um, but there's probably someone else in the room here that knows a bit more uh, than that. I just note that there will be a session devoted to the DSS, which I, some of you, them are in the room, some of them will be coming. And I think you can ask this question there. And again, I would stress that from the point of view of Geo Secretariat, the two issues, in principle, more is better, the more cloud data providers is better, as long as the solutions that run on them can avoid vendor lock-in, as long as the solution is not committed to a single provider. I think this is two mantras that we have to have. We have to do really go for non-vendor dependent solutions and hopefully more solutions that can work and can offer services to the community. The two quick final questions. Um, well, actually, um, I'll do one and then maybe the gentleman over there. Um, again to you, Brian, where is the U.S. data cube? <laughs> oh, that's a sore subject, so, that, right? That was from Miko Stralander. Where is the U.S.? <laughs> You know, it's kind of funny, but uh, I'm going to give Brian's personal opinion why there's not a U.S. data cube. I think it's because we have so many scientists and researchers that tend to have methods in place and do things their own way. And there's really not a demand or a need for this uh, broader set of data or something like a data cube for the entire country. Whereas you go to other countries and they're not uh, as as heavy with researchers and scientists that have been using data for 10 or 20 years. And so the data cube for them is a huge advantage for the data preparation. But in the U.S., you know, I, every other researcher I talk to wants to pre-process the data on their own and start from level one. It, it's absolutely amazing to me, but that's what they do. Well, let me just say uh, one thing. Uh, I don't know if there's someone from the commission here. But also, there's also a reason which is the Commission, European Commission, has been funding projects 
uh, with, an, uh, with uh, inertia observation systematically for the last years in a way different from the U.S. So the calls that have been gone, and they call uh, for consortia to be built, they call for data to be released, they're now calling for all results funded by the taxpayers to be published in open journals. So I think there's something to be said in favor of the Commission's uh, attitude of actively promoting Earth observation as a key area of European expertise, as compared to the United States, where this exists, but in a very diffuse way. You have to write your own call to the NSF. You have to have your own grant. So uh, the, I think the European scene is more organized and more targeted than the American scene. So, gentlemen, the floor. And can I just remind everyone, can you please say who you are before you ask your question? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Tesfaye Korme from Ethiopia. Uh, my question is about the usability of the data cube. Uh, most of the data used, especially the EO data, are nationally used and applied for decision making, most of them at national level. The same is true. Products are, in most cases, product produced at national level, then uploaded. So, since the last 20 years, there was an initiative called NSDI, National Spatial Data Infrastructure, that the countries have been trying to establish so that they can have the data repository policies, standards at national level. I appreciate the values of ARD. It's really fantastic. I've been using it, and it makes radar data very, very useful. So the issue there is uh, what if the data are organized and made available at national level so that we enhance the usability of this data? Because, for example, if you take Ethiopia, may not be interested in the data for Sudan or in Kenya or whatever but mostly interested in the national data. That's why some of the countries are still struggling to build their own satellite while the data is already there. So I think the countries should put in place resources so that they can have and manage a such type of cube data at national level. That's my view. and from my experience. Thank you. I still think that will be possible with uh, the vision we're trying to put together for the Open Data Cube. I'm going to use Digital Earth Africa as an example. And by the way, the Digital Earth Africa Home Office will be in Addis, Ethiopia. It's coming your way very soon. Um, you know, an individual, so all of this data for all of Africa will be in one place in the cloud. And there are in one example where I think that uh, data can be used across borders, you have to think of some of these trans-border problems, right? Trans-border problems with um, water is one, um, just land use in general. Well, if you just have data only for a single country, that becomes a bit of a problem. So one thing about the Digital Earth Africa or these larger data cubes is they're trans-border. It's just a stack of data. Now. Any individual country can take a portion of that data, create their own products, have other sources of data specific to their country, and use it together with the satellite data. So the Open Data Cube is a way to, to stack the satellite data and make it easily accessible. But I certainly believe that countries are going to have some of their own data stored separately that only they will have access to and to use. And they can also create products that can then be stored for their own purposes if they desire and you know don't want to share them with others, which <laughs> tends to happen. So there is some segregation country to country in terms of how they manage their in-situ data, manage their local data, manage their products, but the, the source of the larger set of data and the satellite data is something that's going to be uh, at, a, at a larger scale because it just makes sense, and then they don't have to worry about the cost associated with putting that all in place. Thank you. So we're now heading into the first coffee break. Um, for those who are speaking later, 
and you need speaker notes, you can't actually see speaker notes on the screen. So if you want them printed, come up to the desk here, please. Um, also, um, if you're, uh, as I said, if you're asking a question, can you please state who you are and where you're from? Because it helps provide more context. There are two more questions here on Slido that we're not going to get to answer. One of them is about industry at a cloud level, and the other one is about small, medium, and micro-size enterprises, SMMEs. There is actually another session on Thursday that will have more of an industry feel to it, so we'll be able to address those questions at that time as well. Um, one was about how to work with CEOs. Brian's here, go and talk to him, and the other one was Gio, and Gilberto is here. So you have an opportunity to talk to people at the coffee break. Please be back in here for 10.55. I'm the moderator, and I'm going to start at 11 sharp. So if you don't want to miss it, be back here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 